Uh, welcome this evening. My name is Janet Windeguth. I am the business librarian here at the Crystal Lake Public Library. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I, I don't know about you, but I find Zoom programming a lot easier to get to because I don't have to get in my car and drive anywhere. There's no traffic, there's no weather. Uh, tonight, I am very pleased to introduce Jerome Lacey. Jerome is an economics professor over at the College of DuPage. He's actually a member of their Speakers Bureau, which is a group that if you have any sort of question about a topic, chances are they can find a speaker for you. So I'm very grateful to DuPage College for lending us Jerome this evening. He, Jerome does have a little bit of background and training, but I have been assured multiple times he is not, in fact, an expert. Uh -huh. He's here tonight to just give us a basic overview. So if any of you wanted to think that they were, you're going to be famous and rich by the end of this, I hate to tell you, but most likely not, unless you're already famous and rich, in which case, you know, I can always use some money. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's all I've got, Jerome. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much, Janet. And um, so a couple of things. Um, I, I, feel, I almost feel obligated, right? That I, you know, I was wondering how to do a, a jazzy introduction, but I'm going to go with this. Maybe you've seen it before, maybe you haven't, but I think it's timely. And I'm going to use it as kind of an introduction, see if I can get this going. Is filled with almost, with those who almost adventured, who almost achieved, but ultimately, for them, it proved to be too much. Then there are others, the ones who embrace the moment and commit. And in these moments of truth, these men and women, these mere mortals, just like you and me, as they peer over the edge, they calm their minds, feel their nerves, four simple words that have been whispered by the intrepid since the time of the Romans. Fortune favors the brave. Okay, so that was Jason Bourne, obviously. And I, the reason I love that is, you know, I was a little shocked, right? That was during the Super Bowl. Everybody bet the Rams? I hope so. It was obvious, right? So at any rate, yeah, so the interesting thing about that is that was pretty much the top of the market, okay? And that when I was a little shocked when I saw whatever Matt Damon, whatever his name is, come out and do that. And um, this is a crypto exchange, and the point is, uh, gee, that's kind of funny. And um, and lo and behold, the market I wouldn't say it wasn't the the dead top of the market, but there was. Uh, pretty close okay and the rest is a disaster so that actually what i want to talk about tonight so a couple of things so this is um as janet said this is uh not a how to make a zillion dollars in cryptocurrency um as a matter of fact probably the maybe a leading indicator would be like if you ask me what i think you should do in cryptocurrency you should probably do the opposite and then you might make a lot of money but the point is that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. So what I'm going to talk about actually is a little bit different. What I'm going to talk about is just, so my, my background is in economics. I do have a market background, but not crypto. Um, but the, um, um, my background is in economics, and that's going to be the, the point of view that I'm going to use this evening. And what I'm going to look at is looking at crypto from an econ point of view. And this is kind of uh, macroeconomics, stuff like that. You know, maybe the, maybe you had it in undergrad or maybe you hated it or whatever. But a lot of my focus is going to be on that. Um, and what it all means in terms of, in terms of uh, some of the implications for crypto, things of that nature. So a couple of ground rules. One, um, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. I don't really like talking a lot. So I, if, if you have questions, unmute yourself and interrupt me, okay? Ask the questions, fine. We got a smallish group. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what we, uh, you know, might, might as well interact, right? Um, and again, in terms of um, expertise, and I hate to use that word, but um, 
in terms of expertise, it's not in crypto. Okay, but I uh, there's a couple of things that I'm going to talk about tonight, and that is that that little uh, YouTube thing with Matt Damon was was interesting because the crypto market crashed and crashed hard. Um, how hard? It lost about seventy percent of its value, almost pretty much not time to that commercial, but pretty close. And there's a couple of reasons I think that actually precipitated it. And that's what I want to look at tonight. And also I want to look at it from the perception of how this fits in, you know, in an economics framework. Okay. So that's kind of where I'd like to start. So actually let's start and let's see if I can, uh, if I can get to this, I'm going to go back and forth between uh, kind of a PowerPoint as well as some other stuff. So there is, uh, that was Matt Damon. Okay, here's other famous economists. Here's, an, here's another famous economist. Okay, um, right? Everybody remember David Copperfield, right? This is, um, you know, in terms of uh, how much is your income? How much is your outgo? Well, your income is better than your outgo, you're happy, okay? And this is kind of a comment to, um, to Matt Damon's fortune favors the bull. Yeah, that's probably true. And here's what Mary Lacey said. Only fools are positive, okay? Who's Mary Lacey? Great economist. That was my mother. Uh, at any rate, let's move on. So this is, let's talk about what money is because this is in cryptocurrency, that Damon notwithstanding, um, it's, it's big uh, raison debt is that it's money. So let's talk about money and what money is. So this is kind of your econ 101 definition of money. And there's a couple of things about this, which I think apply and don't apply as far as crypto is concerned. So money basically is a medium of exchange. That is probably its critical, uh, its critical function. It's used to buy and sell goods, all right? It's also a unit of account. It's a store of value. That's gonna enter, I guess, to some extent when we talk about crypto, but certainly in terms of medium of exchange, that's its big deal. So what's money? Is money the amount of crypto we have? It's the amount of gold we have? Okay, the holidays are coming up, right? So here's It's a Wonderful Life, right? And remember, It's a Wonderful Life. We got uh, George Bailey. Basically, what was going on, we had a bank run on the Bailey Savings and Loan, and they didn't have any money. But as George Bailey rightly pointed out, the money is not the amount of cash in the vaults. The money is the amount that people have deposited with the bank. And that is what money is. And that's the, the biggest chunk of money. And the point is, this is not necessarily what crypto has wrong, but the point is when we talk about money, the lion's share of money in certainly the US economy and any kind is checking account. And this is what it is. So let's look at how money looks. And the point is, what happens over time? This is the Federal Reserve uh, chart and you can see it. There's a couple things on this. That red line is money. And money in this case is coin and currency and demand deposits, which is what we call money. Go to Jewel, you give them your debit card. Your debit card is basically a checking account. And you're more than happy to, to accept your check or if you have money, cash money, which nobody has anymore, but you know, they did, that's also legal tender. And the point is that money is going to increase over time, but the point is there's a couple of things. You can see that red line, and the red line is showing that money moving along at mm, kind of a steady pace over time. And then in the, as you can see on that time in the horizontal axis there, is the pandemic and money spiked. And the reason money spiked is because the Federal Reserve came in and put um, a lot of money into checking accounts, but that didn't necessarily translate to buying. Okay, and this is an important, an important feature in the sense is just that just because we define something to be money doesn't mean it gets used as money. And also with that is the amount of inflation. So in other words, you saw the money, amount of money spike 
in this particular period on this chart, this was like, this was the start of the pandemic. And the point is that the amount of inflation did not go up correspondingly. And as a matter of fact, the amount of money crashed at the end of the pandemic, which one would expect because actually a lot of the money left the banking system. And this is the amount of inflation that we're seeing now actually is from the, from a residual after that spike in money. So the point is just because money is expanded doesn't necessarily mean that um, the economy is gonna go. And it also in terms of what is being used to transact stuff, because when you think of money and you think of the economy, the role of money in the economy is to spend, all right? If people are spending that money, then the economy moves. Same thing with crypto. If you have an increase in crypto, if people use it to buy stuff, then that's interesting. And then that is a, a use for money. Here's some money, okay? And here is probably the most important feature of money. And the point is, this is a dollar bill, obviously. And the point is, see if I can get that, my little stylus working here, just for yucks, okay? And the most important thing about this dollar bill is this, okay? Not that it's from the Federal Reserve of New York, but this right here, okay? This is Alexander Hamilton stuff. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. This is the United States of America when any other country would have a similar, a similar phrase on their money. But the point is you can use this in satisfaction of all debts, whether it be the federal government's debt, state government, or any of our debts. You have a debt, you can use this as satisfaction as payment for it. It's legal tender. Cryptocurrency is not legal tender. And that's the distinction. So let's keep moving. So this is not anything that's actually all that interesting so far. You say, no, it isn't. So this is actually, let's look at a couple of things um, before I, um, before we go into some of the stuff. So I'm gonna go back and forth between this PowerPoint and also uh, a lot of this stuff I'm going to be talking about. There's a, an article that came out mm, about a month ago, which we're in October, yeah, about a month ago. So the Federal Reserve put out an article basically talking about this collapse in cryptocurrency. And the question is what drove it, what's going on? And then the, other, the larger question, are there any implications for it? And I, I think the I think the answer is yes, but let's look at this. So here's some of the some of the points. What are the pros? What are the advantages of cryptocurrency? Okay, it's high risk and it has potential for high rewards. I'm not sure that's an advantage, but it's touted as such. This is big. The blockchain technology, the blockchain technology underlying the cryptocurrency is inherently secure. And I would agree with that, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about blockchain, blockchain technology with the proviso that my expertise in predicting cryptocurrency is, is, is great relative to my expertise in blockchain technology, okay? I'm not a computer geek, I'm barely a program. I had trouble turning on the computer to get to, to, to attend this session tonight. So blockchain technology, we're gonna talk about it, but. If you have questions about it, mm, I'm going to refer you to somebody else. Okay. This is a couple of other things, which is interesting. So we have bye-bye for traditional banks. Mm, okay. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. We'll see. Um, and then hello to a fairer, more transparent financial system. I'm not sure I agree with any of those adjectives. Okay. But the point is, we'll get into that. And then this point, crypto trades around the clock. Okay, I guess that's an advantage uh, if you're up late, okay. I teach, uh, so Fred, I, I teach uh, uh, community college and I'm always amazed at what time my students are up doing their homework. It's usually two in the morning and I think they expect me to respond to their emails, which it's never gonna happen. But at any rate, so crypto is trading around the clock. Is that an advantage? Mm, maybe we'll see. And then this last one, cryptocurrencies could help investors beat inflation. That's a little bit of a reach, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's get into some stuff. And this actually, before we get into this, I'd like to look at, so this is actually 
from this Fed article, which actually is, is a, uh, it's an excellent article. And let me see if I can get it up and running. So this is actually the article and this is, gives us a lot of stuff, but this is basically, um, um, as I say, this was, this was done by a consortium of economists at the Fed, 11 of them. Um, so that's kind of a scary visual as we come into Halloween, right? The 11 economists conferring together, who knows? At any rate, so this is basically the hierarchy of crypto. And at the, at the bottom here, the bottom of the pyramid is this concept of the blockchain. And the blockchain basically is a computer program, I'll say, but it's probably a lot more complex than that. And the, and the blocks are, um, are generated and they're generated through a process of solving an incredibly complex mathematical equation. And only if and when you do that, can you make another, can you add to another block in the chain? And all of this stuff is on the record, so to speak, okay? All of that computation, all of that stuff is up there and apparent. And this is in terms of the transactions that are affected on the blockchain recorded and recorded basically forever. So everybody can see what is going on. There's nothing in the dark, nothing in the shadows. And this is the big, big uh, feature that a lot of, uh, that a lot of certainly the, the proponents of crypto talk about quite a bit. And it's, 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 a good, it's, it's good in the sense that it is, um, it's everything is transparent and all the records are there forever. Okay, so that's the blockchain. On top of that is a couple of other things. There's this asset layer and the asset layer is native cryptocurrencies. This is the coins and the stuff that you've heard about. Okay, this is uh, that maybe you trade it and more than just hearing about it. So this is Bitcoin is the biggest one. Uh, Ether, which is Ethereum's um, uh, currency and there's a variety of others. Okay, but they're the the top five basically have something like 95% of the market, something like that. Are there a lot of cryptocurrencies? There's something like 16,000, okay? But the point is, this uh, the top hmm, half a dozen pretty much have most of the market. There's going to be other digital assets. These are not, these are tokens, government's tokens, non-fungible tokens. I'm not going to get into a lot of that. What I'm interested in is talking about these coins. And then I want to talk about stable coins. And that basically is kind of the thrust of tonight's talk. The way this stuff is done or processed is a couple of other things. We are uh, processed on something called decentralized ex exchanges. And this is all part of what's called uh, decentralized finance, okay? And that is basically what that word says. It's financial transactions that don't have a center of, uh, of, um, of um, transaction as you would, let's say, in a, uh, in a commodity exchange like the Board of Trade. So these are decentralized and you, can, and you can trade them anywhere, basically. And they also have a couple of other things that are both yin and yang, some pluses and minuses. There's also lending protocols, okay? And this is going to be part and parcel of our story. Um, there's other uh, DeFi, and DeFi stands for decentralized finance. Um, applications, these are derivatives, there's asset allocations, there's futures contracts, there's options on these things, which are interesting, but actually in terms of the center of our story, aren't really part of what we're gonna be talking about. Also, we're going to be looking at how this stuff gets transacted in terms of websites and how that gets done. And then wallets basically is the interface between individuals. If you've traded crypto, you have to have a wallet, okay? a hot wallet, a cold wallet, where basically you have a hot wallet, you're ready to trade, and your debits and credits relative to the crypto coin are made via that wallet. Okay. That's really not going to be a big part of my discussion what I'm going to talk about. And then we're also going to be talking about centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges. So this is all going to be part and parcel of, the, of our discussion. So that's a lot of fun, you say. So let's keep going. And actually, this is actually, and I'll, I'll reiterate this, um, 
in a couple of uh, in a couple of different ways. So this is actually the market capitalization of major stable coins. Okay, and stable coins I'm going to define in a minute, but it's part and parcel of this universe of assets: the coins, the actual coins, and what's going to be called stable coins. And you notice there's a couple of things. Here's on this axis on the on the horizontal axis time, right? So we're at at, at present time for all intents and purposes, 2022. And you notice a couple of things. This growth in this particular in this particular asset, which is a stable coin, it's pretty remarkable. And it's remarkable from last summer, for all intents and purposes, we looked here last summer to May of this year, okay? And then there's pretty precipitous collapse. And the point is how much is this going down? And this is goes down from like this in billions of dollars, goes from 200 billion to 150 billion. So it's a bit, bit of a hiccup, all right? And the coin is, the point is, well, what happened and why? And there's are the actual coins. I'll be talking about that in a minute. But this is actually one thing I do want to talk about is this is uh, the market capitalization of these assets. But one thing I do want to talk about is in terms of these coins. And the point of this, these are all coins. There's Bitcoin, there's Ether, there's uh, Litecoin is a variety of coin, the Dogecoin, right? If you, are, uh, if you own a Tesla, right? You could have bought it with a Dogecoin. Okay, that's fun. The point I'm making is the way these things trade. Okay, this is the price here on the vertical axis, right? In terms of, what its percent up or down is going to be. And the point is, this is time on the horizontal axis. As you can see, they all pretty much move in a pack. And the point is you can make a, and the trading in these, in these contracts are huge in the sense that people are buying one, selling another. And this is a very active market. And the size of the market, I think we'll, I'll look at this in a second, but the, um, the size of the market is huge. And the point is you can make money by buying one, selling another. There's, there's idiosyncrasies of each that are going to suggest you might be doing that. I'm not gonna get into that, okay? The point is, the larger point that jumps out at me is how they all move in a pack, okay? They're all basically moving to the downside over this particular time period, which brings us back to our, our point. This is the actual, market capitalization of cryptocurrencies. You can see that we had a certain amount of, this is over time from when it started, started basically 2013 and actually started 2008, which is kind of where I want to go with all of this. But the point is we had a very big uptick in terms of the value of this market, okay? When the beginning basically of hmm, start of 2021, but here is a, the point I want to make. The peak, as you can see, if I can put this here, is that is this is in, uh, if we just do the numbers, right? That's $3 trillion. That's dollars. Cash money, okay? That's $3 trillion. That's a lot of beer. And the point is, that's when it was, and you can see what the time was, November 21st. Okay, or November 2021, probably when Matt Damon was starting to film his commercial, I would guess, or close to that. At any rate, the point is, what happened? Well, where is it now? Well, let's just see where it is now. Oops, that's kind of a lot. Okay, it's under a trillion. Okay, a trillion dollars is still a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. Okay, it's um, it's uh, trillions of trillion. And, uh, and the point is, uh, right, a lot of beer, but the point is, it gave up from three trillion to under a trillion. Oops, what happened? Well, let's see. So this is, let's go back to our hero. I'm sorry, I'm the map, I'm going too fast. How would, how's everybody doing? Good? Sort of good? Good. Sounds good. Okay, okay. Stop me if you have questions. So this is some of the pros. And the point is the people who like cryptocurrency or long cryptocurrency are going to um, are going to be pushing this, right? Matt Damon, the one, I think it's meant, I think one of the Kardashians, I think, got fined this morning or something like that. I forgot what I was, uh, I don't pay that much attention to the Kardashians. But at any rate, the point is, if you are a big proponent, that's what you care about. 
So let's look at some of this stuff. Here's how the blockchain works, okay? And, and this is, I'm not going to go into this because, A, I don't understand probably understand it less than all of you. But the point is, this is basically, it's written in code. And the way that this is expanded is through solving fairly, high, well, I should say, extremely complex mathematical equations. And once that is solved, then you get to add a little bit to the block, okay? And this is called a certain type of format. This is called proof of work. And the point is the computation power that is required, in other words, it doesn't take just one computer, it takes a lot of computers to solve this. And this is power requirements that actually are quite daunting. And this is in terms of mining, the mining actually is a word that they have, and it seems like crypto has a word for everything. But mining is basically creating new coins. Okay, this is increasing the supply, and they increase the supply by, by this concept of the proof of work. And this is adding to the blockchain. But the computation requirements in terms of electri electricity are incredible. And you may have heard that the merge and the merge that Ethereum, which is the other big um, cryptocurrency, did is they went to a different type of a different type of expanding. This is called this. Well, this is the power. This is the power um, uh, requirements. Okay, and this is how much is it? Well, it's uh, enough to light up. Uh, I don't know Ireland or Indonesia or something like that. So at any rate, it's a lot. It's a lot of power. Now this Ethereum move to the merge is that they're going out of proof of work into this other concept called proof of stake. And what this does is that it lowers the a couple of things. It makes the addition to the blockchain quite a bit lower in, in terms of the amount of hoops that, that, that have to be jumped through. And then also in terms of the, the power requirement that is, that is needed is dramatically reduced. Okay, so that's basically blockchain stuff. So... Let's look at this. So let's say you're out at Tesla. Is there a Tesla dealer in Crystal Lake? I don't know. There's five, I think, right? We'll say yes for this right. particular. I, I have no idea. Okay, so who knows? So the question is, so this is, uh, you know, your favorite friend and mine, Elon Musk, right? And he said, um, he said, hey, you can pay for Teslas in Dogecoin, okay, which is a cryptocurrency. Well, that's fun, isn't it? So the point is, this is that, that opening slide, right? In other words, can you use cryptocurrency to buy and sell stuff? Is it a medium of exchange? Well, let's just think about it, okay? If it's a medium of exchange, okay, and that price, we talked about that price, right? And actually, let's just look here. I'll do, a, I'll do my, my stylus. There's a couple of things I should note, and I, I tell my students that, and hopefully you're more sympathetic. So I wouldn't say that, um, I wouldn't say it's the only class I've ever flunked in my speckled career, but one class I flunked, two classes I flunked was handwriting. I have horrible handwriting, okay? Sister Margaret beat me and it didn't do any good. So the point is I have hard and still have horrible handwriting, so you're just gonna have to suffer. Another was art. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, no good at art, no good at, uh, at uh, handwriting. But the point is, here's the deal. Let's actually draw a little picture. Okay, let's we say we have a demand and supply curve. Okay, so for those who are not in economics, so this is, we have a price, and that is going to be on this axis. Higher prices go in that direction. Higher quantities go in that direction. And we have a demand curve. Okay. And we have a supply curve, and that is where the meeting of the minds takes place, okay? All the people who are buying stuff have that or express that relationship in that, in that demand curve. All the people who want to sell stuff is, are going to represent that uh, desire in that curve. And it's going to intersect at an equilibrium price, okay? You say, okay, fine, good. Let's just call that little price P star. And the point is, remember that the, the price of Bitcoin prior to November, right, was, what it do? Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. And that would include all cryptocurrencies, okay? I'm losing my 
my uh, my uh, stylus. So this is time in this axis, and this is the value of cryptocurrency. Let's say let's say it's Dogecoin. Okay, the price of Dogecoin. And up until November, this thing with all the currencies based is going up and up and up. Okay, not crash. Okay, so that's fun. But the point is, how much Dogecoin do you have to? buy okay or in other words if the amount of Doge, dogecoin or the value of dogecoin is going up which it was okay because all cryptocurrencies were going up the question is how much is uh elon musk going to take in terms of dogecoin to buy a new tesla well the point is as long as this is going up and you know that's that's going his way okay but the point is if this is going down okay this gets to be kind of spongier right so if you're a merchant right if you're the seller of this particular good what's the good teslas or if you're the buyer of a tesla if the underlying currency which is what dogecoin is is going up and down like crazy which it was the question is is anybody want to play and the point is if you are going to buy tesla and you want to pay in dogecoin what's going to be clearly priced in dogecoin and the point is it's going to change and what's it going to change by it's going to change by what the market's doing okay it's probably going to go i would guess in elon musk's favor okay that's not a really insightful thing but the point is it's going to be a variable price okay and then the question is is that really a good way to do business no okay if the price of a uh, particular of the, of the currency that we haven't been talking about when we looked at money right we said what is the value of money well we didn't have a value of money the value of money was always assumed to be equal to whatever the same price there wasn't a price for the underlying value of money in cryptocurrencies it's not the case is it they were going up at least up until november they were going up then things change and this is uh the point so what happened then of uh, we kind of can go fast forward oh what happened oh tesla had a lot of bitcoin okay what they do they sold them all oh that's fine at any rate but that's you know just another point here's what's going on and this is actually the same thing. This is kind of a demand and a supply curve, okay? And the point is, this is a representation or my, my simple representation of what cryptocurrency looks like. And the supply curve looks something like this. And why do I say that? It has this funny little shape, okay? It, goes, it's, it keeps going higher and higher. The quantity, this is the quantity of uh, a cryptocurrency and the question is what is its price okay and we saw up until november that price kept going up which is great okay but the point is the supply due to that blockchain technology we run into a problem with blockchain technology because in terms of expanding it can't expand as fast and therefore the supply of these cryptocurrencies meets in some sense some resistance and this is the what they mean in terms of touting cryptocurrency in terms of is it an inflation fighter? Eh, kind of it is because there's a natural resistance to increase supply. And all of those, those arguments for cryptocurrency are supply arguments in the sense that it's hard to increase the blockchain. That's a supply argument that you can't arbitrarily increase the supply or the amount of supply of a currency that you're going to be able to increase is going to be limited okay however we did know that the, the price of the currency went up so what's going up the demand curve who's buying this stuff okay the point is who's ever buying this stuff is whoever wants to own cryptocurrency and the question is why are they buying the cryptocurrency in terms of our definition of money, remember our definition of money was, if I can get it up here, I think, uh, we can go back a couple slides, but I think I'll just draw it in, make you suffer looking at my horrible handwriting. Remember what money was. Money was, its biggest deal was it was a medium of exchange, okay? And what that means is, 
you want to buy and sell goods, okay, you want to buy or sell goods, right, you use money to do it. However, if the value of money, if this demand curve, people are buying these, these, these cryptocurrencies, and this demand curve keeps moving, the supply curve, not so much, what happens to the price? It keeps going up. Okay. And if that's the case, is that good? Uh, I don't know. Not so good for the buyer, right? Okay. Maybe for the seller, it's good. But the point is, if this is our concept of money keeps going higher or its value keeps going higher, its value as a medium of exchange is very poor. And when we talk about in terms of the dollar, the value of the dollar, do you consider the value of the dollar when you go to buy whatever, bag of oranges from Jewel? No, you don't because the value of the dollar is stable, okay? Which brings in our next little guy, and that is, so if we want to do business, right? In other words, we had the, in terms of the blockchain, one thing that is on, on top of that blockchain is this concept of cryptocurrency, a coin. But the reality is there's a lot of demand for that coin. The supply arguments are quite strong, okay? It's this blockchain argument. But the point is that the demand argument, people are piling into this cryptocurrency, into these coins. So let's use Bitcoin as a case in point. So the value of Bitcoin keeps going higher and higher. Okay. Good deal in terms of using that as a, as a medium of exchange in order to buy and sell goods. No, it's a horrible thing. And the point is if it goes up, only one side of the transaction benefits. Or if it goes down suddenly, only one side benefits. The point is you want to have, in order to, to have commerce, you have to have a stable currency, hence this concept, stable coin, okay? So the point is then a stable coin then is a solution to the underlying volatility of these crypto coins. What's a stable coin? So the stable coin basically is tied to an asset, right? And what's the asset? Well. The biggest asset in the world, okay, and that is the dollar. Okay, so the stable coins typically are tied to the dollar. They could be tied to something else, right? They could be tied to gold, right? The dollar used to be tied to gold. It could be a commodity or any commodity. But the point is, this is what it's tied to. And the point is that the ratio in a stable coin is a stable coin, whatever it is. Let's say one stable coin. The game is keep it equal to one dollar. Okay, and if that's the case, then our stable coins can be used to make transactions, right? Because then that answers all of these other questions. So if we have if Dogecoin was a stable coin, then we could have a constant level. Elon Musk could charge us a stable price in 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 Doge coins if they were in fact stable coins, which they're not. And the point is, then this stable coin could become a medium of exchange. It becomes money, all right? It's that, that little section on our $10 bill. This is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Well, it wouldn't be legal tender, but it would certainly solve the economics of it, okay? So the legal tender, obviously, is there is a legal term, obviously. And this is basically an economic term. So in order to become a medium of exchange, it has to have stability and the stable coin then is equal to basically $1, okay? So that's fun, you say. And the, and the question is, do stable coins then become currency? Do Are they used to transact goods and services? And the answer is no, for a variety of reasons. But the point is, they haven't been used to transact currency, but the growth of stable coins, quite dramatic, okay? And as a matter of fact, that was one of the, let's go back to that really quick. Um, and I think I have one of my little charts that shows the growth of stable coins, right? And this is, uh, let's look. Uh, and, here we are. Stable coins. There they are. Okay. And the point is, here's these stable coins. You can see what's happening. This is from basically last summer, right? And this is the growth of stable coins. What did it grow to? 
two and a billion, a lot, okay? And then, lo and behold, May, roughly, May 16th, to be exact, it collapsed. And it collapsed basically 25%, something like that, from 200 to about 170. We can actually get the number, okay? And, they, and you can see that this is the, the, the coloring here is the amount of stable coins. So this is the US dollar, this is the USD. And we have um, a couple of BAIs. There's a couple of different stable coins. There's one stable coin that is conspicuous by its absence. And let's actually see if we can uh, go there. Um, and here it is, okay? This is USTC and that is Terra. It's another stable coin. Prior to May 16th, that was fifth largest stable coin. And the point is, well, what happened? So what happened was basically a couple of things. This is there's a growth of stable coins. And the question is, well, what are they used for? If they're not used to buy and sell goods and services, what are they used for? They're used to buy and sell other crypto assets. And that's what they're used for. And the point is that the growth of crypto assets over this particular period of time is gunned, if you will, by its this um, this juice, if you will, of stable coins. Stable coins are not being used to transact goods and services, but they are used to buy and sell other crypto assets. So let's see how that's done and see some of the maybe problems that happen there. So before I go on, how are we doing? Everybody good? Questions? You can always put the questions in chat too if you are yes. shy or your mic's not working. Let's look at this. So this is basically decentralized finance. And decentralized finance is basically using crypto assets and, and, and the way we're going to be using them is using stable coin basically to buy and sell stuff. But we can't use it to buy and sell actual stuff. So what we're going to be using it is to buy and sell other crypto assets. Okay, so this is a lot of fun. And the point is, this is what we're going to be using and, the, and some of the vehicles we're going to be using actually are, as we are going to see, are going to... Mm, Contribute to the problem. This is basically that little chart I, show, I showed you that this is this is crypto assets or digital assets. And currently they're at 900 billion for a number. And November of last year, they were at 3 trillion. Okay. So this is kind of a little bit of a down tick, right? It's a huge hit, right? If this happened in any other market, right? It would be, uh, you know, we would be out, you know, out in the streets, right? With pitchforks. So the point is, this is, What's going on? What's going on is they had a huge downturn. What's going on? There's a variety of other things. So in other words, how this stuff is, is decided is through this thing called decentralized autonomous organizations. That's a lot. And the point is, this is how the structure is, is going to make decisions and smart contracts are actually code that are going to be used to force those decisions. Okay, so that is kind of an interesting thing. We have this other thing called a decentralized exchange. Okay, decentralized as an exchange is that this is a protocol for markets exchanging one crypto asset for another. And the question is, how do they get transacted through stable coin? And the reason for that is that the amount of money that it's going to take each time you do a trade and you were, let's say, putting that coin back into the currency, which in this case is going to be the currency, the actual currency, let's say dollars, that's going to cost you a lot of money to get in and out. And stable coin basically is going to be the grease that is going to enable you to reduce those fees. And that's why stable coin became so popular. Here's a couple of things. So you can lend in these decentralized exchanges. In other words, if you have stable coin, okay, you've got it. The question is, why would you hold stable coins? This concept of money, right? So you're not using it to buy anything, right? What are you using it for? Well, one thing you're going to be using it for possibly is to own crypto assets. And as long as the price of crypto assets are going up, good for you. And the point is, until and unless you do that, you park it. It's the store of value, if you will, for money. So it does have some of the 
attributes of money, but with the end goal of we're not buying any goods and services, we're just buying crypto assets. Okay, this sounds like kind of a, I don't know, Ponzi scheme, is that a good word? Maybe too strong. At any rate, so let's, what's going on? So the point is you can, you can lend your money in these decentralized exchanges. And what is your money? Stable coins. And you, what are you going to get for your stable coins? You get a fairly substantial rate of interest, okay? Much more than you would get at a bank, but the point is we're talking about crypto coin, okay? Not, well, in this case, stable coin, not actual dollars. How about the other side of the trade, okay? Because if there's a lender, right? You're lending your stable coin. There's also a borrower of stable coin, right? And the question is, does the borrower have any, mm, do they have any incentive? They, it turns out they have a variety of incentives because there's a variety of decentralized exchanges. So what you can do is you can lend money, okay? In other words, you are, you can lend money if you are, uh, if you have stable coin, but you can also borrow money. So you borrow stable coin and what do you promise in terms of collateral? Like if you were to borrow money to buy your house, right? You put up your house as collateral. So you got to have collateral. What's a collateral? Well, the collateral is other crypto assets. Okay, good for you. And let's say you borrow. Let's say you have crypto assets, and you say I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow eighty percent on my crypto assets. Could be non fungible tokens. Could be tokens. Could be a variety of things. Could be actual coins. And the point is. Then you have that locked up. You borrowed, let's say, 80% on against the value of that. And the question is, can you do anything else? And the answer is, yeah, you can go to another decentralized exchange. And the same assets that you promise as collateral on your first loan, you can promise them as collateral on another loan. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. So this is rehypothecation. And the point is, instead of, 80% loans, then now you have a 90% loan and you can continue to do that. So the point is that the leverage in the system grows. And the question you might ask is, well, who's the sheriff on this? There is no sheriff, okay? And the question is, can you do this? Yeah, you can do it till the cows come home. So the point is, in these decentralized exchanges, we have a lot of leverage built into the loans, okay? So what happens? Well, you know, as long as the price of the underlying thing is going up, everybody's fat and happy, okay? And the point is oracles basically are uh, bridges and communications between one exchange versus another. And the point is, as long as everything is working fine, this is, this everything works out okay. Then there's little games. And these flash loans are instantaneous loans that you can take out if you can compromise the collateral in a particular exchange for a particular loan. And if that's the case, then you can force that collateral to be, to be liquidated via some of these smart contracts and then buy back the cheap collateral, basically forcing some sort of a... Uh, basically, uh, 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 not a wash sale, but a uh, kind of a fire sale. So the point is, it's uh, the decentralized exchanges, big leverage, okay? Then we have the lending platforms, okay? The lending platforms are actual platforms, okay? And the, and the sense is that we actually have traditional platforms, and this is this one, and this, uh, and there's, a. Uh, uh, in addition, there's also this, this, in terms of centralized crypto exchanges. And the question is, these it looks like a bank, okay? And the question is, what are they going to do? So they are actually loaning out money and they are going to get interest, okay? And the question is, how much interest? Um, and they can loan that money out, okay? And they, depends how they collateralize their loans, okay? So in other words, if they're loaning out money, okay? In other words, you, you are loaning money and you get, and again, I'll do a, sorry. I'll do a, um, yeah, maybe the counting is kind of not everybody's cup of tea, but the point is if you're loaning out money, sorry, I'm getting, uh, kidding, my stylus is rebelling on me. So this is, 
If I'm loaning money out, okay, what do I loan money out? You give me dollars, I'm going to give you a stable coin, okay? And the point is, that's good, all right? And the question is, what do I do with the dollar? Here's the people, right? This is the entity. What are they going to do with the dollars? And the answer is, they're going to invest it, depending on who they are, okay? But we have centralized, we have decentralized um, lending platforms. And the point is, if I take in, I'm lending money, so I'm loaning, I'm loaning okay, dollars, right? Excuse me. I'm loaning stable coin, right? And I'm getting dollars. And the question is, what do I do with this collateral? Okay, and the, and the point is, some actually buy other assets because this is just like a bank. It looks just like a bank. You take the money in, these are dollars, you have stable coin. Remember what the ratio is. In a stable coin, the stable coin is equal to $1. And this is called a peg, right? But it's the same thing you do with your dollars, right? In other words, you assume that the dollar is not going to change in value. So the dollar is equal to a dollar. In this case, stable coin is equal to a dollar. So as long as that peg is maintained, this is fine. So the point is there are lending platforms, centralized lending platforms, and this is they can put their dollars into other assets. So the one, there's two types of assets they can they can put this into, just like a bank. So some of them they're gonna keep in dollars and the others they're going to actually put into other assets. What are other assets? Mm, Short-term securities, okay. Commercial paper. So for those of you who don't know what commercial paper is, commercial paper is, is debt obligations, short-term debt obligations issued by corporations. And they earn a rate of interest, just like a bank. Here's the deal, with a bank, however, there is a certain reserve requirement. In other words, the Federal Reserve says you can only loan out so much money on this, okay? In these platforms, not so much, okay? And the Federal Reserve, that reserve ratio right now is probably around 3%, something like that. In cryptocurrency, the ratio is something like about as low as 0.1% or possibly even lower. The point is what's going on here is leverage. And the point is that in terms of leverage, the amount of assets vis-a-vis -vis what the assets are controlling are going to be stilted relative to how we would look at this in terms of uh, traditional banking. Okay, so yes, I know I can understand. I can I, I can I can sense the yawns of people talking about traditional banking. Let's actually talk about this. Let's talk about stablecoin and talk about basically a couple different players and see who is going to play and who isn't. So this is stablecoin. We have centralized lenders. And the question is, we have centralized lenders and decentralized lenders. Okay, The centralized lenders is what we talked about. And this is actual. You have to go to an individual to go to a, a, a protocol, it's called. And basically, you give them money, and they're going to give you stablecoin. They're going to take the stablecoin, basically, and give it to the market. right? And then they're going to have this leveraged effect on what this um, of, uh, of their balance sheet relative to how the market's going to move, which is fun. So let's look at a couple of these players. There's four players here. And as I said, the stable coin universe is only five deep, right? And that's pretty much most of the market. So here's a couple of things. Here's Tether. This is uh, Ethereum's um, stable coin, okay? Uh, Ether is, a, is the actual uh, cryptocurrency and Tether is the stable coin. USD coin is something a little different. Tether actually puts its stuff into securities, but not US securities. This actually USD coin actually puts it into short-term treasury securities. So in this, on, the, on what they're putting those dollars into, they put them into actual dollars. Some of them they keep in the actual dollars and others they put them into short-term treasury securities. Okay? Tether actually is one of the biggest holders of commercial paper. Commercial paper, is not necessarily liquid, okay? If things get bad in the, in the overall economy, when did this happen? 2008. 2008, the commercial paper market collapsed, okay? But it didn't collapse here. But the point is, here's Tether, basically putting all of its money into commercial paper, USD coin, eh, not so much. This, both of these look like um, traditional banking, except that the leverage is quite a bit more it's quite a bit higher. Here's a couple of other players. Here's DAI. This is also a stable coin. And remember what we want, okay? You're getting a dollar, right? And you're issuing a stable coin. And those are the stable coins. One dollar, equal one stable coin. 
okay? All good. And that is that peg, if you will, has to stay. If it doesn't stay, we got problems. How do we have problems? What we have problems, if the peg doesn't stay, then you are going to, or at least the supposition is that you can go in and liquidate the assets that are backing this, right? Makes sense. If this is a USD coin and its value, it's peg dollar to one stable coin. Here's a stable coin from that stable coin. And if that becomes less than one to one, you can liquidate the underlying assets. These are treasury assets and they're actual dollars, okay? Maybe very over leveraged, but they're there. Tether, not so much, okay? That's a what's called commercial paper and longer term securities. Can you immediately liquidate it? In a good market, yeah, okay. So that's, you know, it's a little risky, but not too bad. How about this guy? Here's DAI. What did they collateralize it? They're in decentralized, this is a centralized exchange. This is a decentralized exchange. And the question is, what's the collateral? Well, the collateral actually is other cryptocurrencies. Oh, well, that's fun. Or crypto assets, let's call them, generically speaking. And the point is, with DAI, this is actually over collateralized. In other words, they take crypto assets, and the point is they over collateralize similar ratio, ratio about two to one which if the underlying assets, i.e. the cryptocurrencies, remain constant or remain stable, no problem, okay? However, if you have the cryptocurrencies falling, how, do, how much did we fall? Well, remember what we did? We had time here. Cryptocurrencies went from whatever, three trillion to one trillion. What happens to these things? If they're two to one, really doesn't make any difference, okay? If it's falling like a rock. And then we have the poster child. And the poster child here is Terra, okay? Terra is a, is a stable coin, okay? And again, stable coin, same deal, stable coin, one-to-one -one with the dollar. What did they do with the dollar? So all of these, you can see the stable coins are, have this underlying, don't have to have an underlying relationship with the, with the cryptocurrency, but typically they all do. Tether is with Ethereum, okay? This is... Terra is with a thing that's called Luna. And that was its crypto coin. And the point is, what did they back those dollars that they got from the unsuspecting public? What did they do? They bought the cryptocurrency of Terra, which is Luna. Okay. So that's fine. And the point is, as long as the one's going up, then this goes up. And this basically becomes... Is this a Ponzi scheme? I don't know. That might be a bit harsh. But the point is, as long as one's going up, the other's going up. And the, and the point is that the amount of stablecoin of Terra, it became the fifth largest stablecoin over that period of time that we're talking about. Okay. And so what happened? Well, what happened was... I would say, you know, I wouldn't blame the entire problem here on Matt Damon, but the point is it started going south. And what happens in terms of all this stuff? You can see the amount of leverage that's built up into this, okay? The amount of leverage that's built up, not only in those stable coins with regard to, with regard to um, um, uh, all of those other things, we, we also are looking at the, not only the stablecoin with, with regard to Luna, but all the entire system is over leveraged. And the point is, what happens? Well, what happens is this. And let's get let's go straight to the to the to the something to the semi ending here. Here's Luna. Okay. And what's going on? The point is, this is basically they're the same thing. One's a stablecoin. One's the the underlying currency, and where is this? Well, this is May, and more importantly, it's May 16th. And the point is, what happens is that this falls, and the point is that the underlying collateral of the stable coin, so the stable coin broke the buck, or it broke the peg. It no longer, that, that stable coin for Terra was no longer equivalent to $1. It's lower than a dollar, okay? So what do you have to do? You have to sell the underlying collateral, but the underlying collateral is the currency that basically funds this stablecoin. And the point is then this led to what, what 
what the crypto people call a death spiral, what I think any other person would call logic. And the point is, this is going to force liquidation. So what happens? So what happens is exactly this. You can see what happens is the price of Luna goes to zero for all intents and purposes, and the, and the stable coin also goes to zero. But that's not all. What's not all is that every other Bitcoin and every other stable coin basically gets compromised. Since the collateral for the stable coin was relatively stable, I hate to use that word twice, but the point is, since that is relatively secure, the stable coins lost 25% of their value. All right, they went from 200 million to, to basically 150 million. Big hit. Okay, that's a hit and a half. But the point is the entire crypto universe basically lost 70% of its value. And that's the point. It was a monster liquidation cycle. And the point is it's not surprising because there is this fabulous amount of leverage built up, not only in this particular offending, uh, offending um, uh, case with regard to uh, Luna and with regard to uh, Terra, okay? And the, and the genesis of it is that the underlying collateral is garbage, okay? And, right, emperor's new clothes. Who's the little girl on that thing? Hey, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. That's correct. He's not. And the point is, this forces a liquidation. It forces a liquidation not only in this. This, is the, this was the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor, right? But the point is, this is the... The cherry on top of the Sunday, right? And this is basically getting smashed, I guess. I'm gonna keep a consistent metaphor. And the point is, that's going to be basically crushed. But it also forces the entire system to go down. Okay. And the question is, have we ever seen this before? Let's go back in time a little bit. Let's go to 2008. What was everybody doing in 2008? having lots of fun, right? What were we doing? The point is, we, what we're doing is we were doing these things called collateralized debt obligations. And what we do, we put basically garbage, okay, triple B rated stuff, and we put it into a different tier in terms of say, well, we have so much coverage of the possible liabilities. And it's the same concept, right? Do we actually have the stuff covered? No, you absolutely don't have anything covered. And the point is, what happened is, who bought this stuff? Mm, banks, okay? And they put, basically had this, they had what they called special investment vehicles, and they put the stuff off the bank, such off their balance sheet, such that the leverage in the banking system was fabulous, fabulously high and fabulously dangerous. What happened? What happened is that the banking system, depending on your point of view, was either bankrupt or insolvent, okay? Let's just say it was insolvent, just to be kind. What was the underlying, what was the underlying asset? Houses, right? This was all mortgages put on housing. And the point is the same thing. It was the same concept. In other words, what was the value of cryptocurrency? It kept going up because it went up. And the reason it went up is because of these financing schemes. And we have this monster amount of leverage. Okay. What happens? Once the thing falls, it falls hard. Okay, and that's what happened to housing. And the question is, in the United States, and actually in the globe, what happened? What happened was, who comes to the rescue? The Fed. Okay, in other words, the Fed then puts money into the banking system. And this is actually putting money into the banking system. What's money? Money is money. It's checking accounts, putting money into the checking accounts. Okay, can you do that in a crypto environment? How? Okay, and that's the question. So that basically is it. Um, and then the next question is, well, what is the Fed doing? Okay, now this is, that's 20,008. Okay, we're, yeah, say we're still living with it, kind of still living with it. But let's, well, let's go back to the original thing. Why cryptocurrency? Well, it's 24 hour payments. You can see, first of all, they're not legal tender. Okay. Two, the stable coins are not legal, legal tender. And three, the stable coins aren't even stable. And the question, then the next question was, well, who is the sheriff? Who's writing shotgun on this stuff? And the answer is nobody. 
Well, that's uh, that's reassuring. And uh, and uh, and the point is that this is should it be surprising that the value of crypto assets have gone down seventy percent and stayed there? No, it's not. So Bitcoin can't get out of its own way at nineteen thousand, which is you know still a lot of money. Uh, it doesn't have to last forever, but the point is that's the genesis of it. What does the Fed do? Remember one of the the uh, big deals in terms of cryptocurrencies. Well, you can trade 24 hours a day. Why would you want to trade? Well, I have no idea, but you know, whatever. You want to trade 24 hours a day. Okay, this is starting, okay, 2023, which is coming right up. Okay, guess what it is? It's the Fed, 24 hour payments. Oh, do tell. Okay, that's kind of interesting. And the point is, this is the Fed basically doing instantaneous payments across the globe anytime you want. And the question is, and the point is, they are writing shotgun on these transactions. Okay. So the point is, is that going to be a, is that going to be a hallmark of crypto going forward or stable coins going forward? Couple, don't see. And then the last is this, okay, who is going, what's going on with the treasury? So they're not, they're looking, okay, but the point is they haven't done it. This is Gianna Yellen, Rick, and they're looking. Yeah, they're looking. They're going to do a cryptocurrency, okay? And the question is, this is going to be, a if, if they do it, which I suspect they probably will, and this is going to be a central bank cryptocurrency. What does that mean? What that means is that this, okay, where is it going to be on, that's going to be a cryptocurrency is a stable coin is what they care about. The, the treasury doesn't care about making money, right? They're, looking, they're trying to basically put out, um, if they do a cryptocurrency, they're doing it because they want to expand the use of currency. But the point is, this is where it's going to be, okay? It's going to be centralized because it's going to be the treasury and it's going to be collateralized, okay? So what do these other cowboys do? Don't know, okay? I guess if I was blowing that stuff, I'd be a little concerned. So, at any rate, so that is it. That kind of a quick shave and haircut. It wasn't that quick, was it? Okay. You don't have to tell um, That is, um, that's basically the economics, if you will, of cryptocurrency. And, and there's a lot of other things. There's a lot of, it's a lot more complex. As you can see, the size of the market is monstrous. Okay. It used to be $3 trillion. That's, uh, that's monstrous. And the, and the point is, uh, it's got crushed, but there's good reasons for it's got crushed. Do you want to call it fraud? Ah, that's such a harsh term, don't you feel? Um, at any rate, no, it's not fraud. But the point is, everybody went into it with their eyes open, and the point is, this is what happened. And the point is, there's there's there is fragilities in the system, and there's also actual mm, things that you could see coming. Okay. And it's 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 interesting. I just think that in terms of, you know, and again, you know, I don't want to pick on Matt Damon. Yeah, I kind of do. The um, uh, but the, he wasn't alone, right? I think there's some basketball players saying, "Hey, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread," as well. And the timing of it is pretty interesting in the sense that um, as the stuff comes out, not it's not that just that once that gets into the public view. Uh, that's always the top of the market, but invariably, I'd say that you know when those things come out, it's probably not a bad idea to keep one hand on your uh, wallet because your pocket is about to get picked. So that's it. I think I'm shutting up and uh, done proselytizing. And uh, let me throw it open to anybody who have questions, comments, horror stories that you want to share made lost tons of money in crypto i've got nothing but this was fascinating i don't pretend to know understand all of it but it, i know more than when i started okay i'm sorry anybody else um anybody i so you have to unmute yourself to to or the chat however you all want to do or the it chat. oh yeah you can do the chat Hello. Hi. Hello, uh, uh, Mr. Lacey, a uh, question for you. How, how does, I mean, what I don't really understand with this is how do you get to the point where you're actually doing 
you're actually buying something like your Tesla example. Where, where does it, when does it get to that point? I don't that's understand. A, that's a great question. Um, and I think the, the, the quick and dirty answer is never. Uh, but you could, right, in the sense that, um, so, so I, you know, and again, I, I'm not shopping for Teslas. So I don't, so I, I just go on their website. And so like, what's the deal? So the point is if, the, if Dogecoin is going up, okay, and uh, it's, it's going up like a racket ship, they're going to quote you a price in Dogecoin, okay? But it's going to change all the time. And as you can probably bet, it's the price they're going to quote you in Dogecoin is always going to go in their favor. I mean, they could, it, it, if you think about it, Dogecoin is, or any coin, I'm going to pick on Dogecoin or, or Elon Musk, but, but it's so easy and fun, right? But that it's, uh, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the point is, it's like anything else. It's, an, it's not money, it's an asset. Okay. okay. And, and I guess it's, it'd be the same thing if I said, if I'm running, you know, my uh, car dealership or whatever, I said, you know what, um, I don't want to get paid in dollars, pay me an Apple stock. Okay. All right. And you say, okay, fine. I just happen to have, you know, 10,000 shares of Apple stock. Okay. No, 10,000 shares of Apple. But anyway, the point, and the point is, well, how many shares is it going to be? Well, you know what the calculation is. So we'll say, well, let me see. I want 70 grand for my Tesla. Apple stock is whatever, 250 bucks. So here's what it is. Okay. You know, so it's, it, that's the calculation, right? And so you could do that. But I guess my question is, um, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is the thing, you know, so so cryptocurrency is, is cute and it's fun and everybody loves it and they're crowding into it. And that's the thing, you know, it's it's like an asset class. And again, okay, now I, I don't see everybody's picture here. And 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 generally my classes, I got I, I talked, my classes are 18 year olds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so I'm really happy. Eighteen year old I'm really, person. <laughs> I'm really happy to see you guys. So if and the point is, is hey, we ever had an asset class that went out of control? Like, well, yeah. anybody who lived in the nineties knows. Gee, well, dot com. Let me say, was that rational? Well, um, no, you know. But the point is, it's the same thing. You know, could you could you pay in an asset? Sure. Do assets go up? Yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And do they go up sometimes in an insane way? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I'm not saying don't buy it, buy it, or anything like that. But the point is, it's, um, um, at the moment, it's an asset. Okay. Can it, can it become a, a bona fide medium of exchange? Yeah, it could. But here's the other thing, though. The Fed's looking at it, and the Treasury's looking at it. And that is, you know, does that, do they trade side by side? I don't know. You know, that's, that's, that's an interesting question going forward. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a great question. Um, um, you know, the future of it, it's, it's I mean, and as I say, the, mind, the, the, the size of the market is unbelievable. You know, there's a lot of money uh, prior to the to the, you know, the swoon uh, was just that people made a ton of money. And it's real money, right? In other words, you can convert this stuff, okay? You get whatever, trillion dollars, whatever, a billion dollars in, in Bitcoin. You can trade it, you know, boom. You just, there's, there's, I mean, it, it can't get out maybe all at once, but you can get out, right? And that's real dollars, okay? And I'm sure the people that got out are really happy. Ones that didn't are really sad. So. Anybody else have last thoughts, last questions? All right. Well, so I'm going to call it last chance going once, going twice. Last call, right? So, are you going to flip the lights like we do in a bar? <laughs> or maybe no. we could we have a virtual drink. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Jerome, thank you again thank for tonight. You. And I will try and stop recording, and then we'll go from there.
Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Okay. Thank Have you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks. All right, bye. Bye-bye.